Well, hi there, students. This is Mr. Verzat. This video will be an introductory video on basic clay sculpture. Now, this will be very basic. We'll just be outlining how to apply a variety of thinking techniques to how we sculpt and why, and also different sculpting techniques. The way to think when sculpting is like this. Three is the magic number. Big, middle, and little. First, you start with the big, major forms. Then you refine them down into middle-sized anatomy. And then you focus on small forms and fine details last. For example, let's say you're going to sculpt this robot. Well, you would start with the big, major forms, and it wouldn't look anything like a robot. Next, you focus on the anatomy. Where are the joints at? Where are the shoulder pads? Where's the head? Those are things that would start to read as, oh, okay, it's less of a troll and more of a robotic looking thing. And then you'd focus on the little details. All right, making those joints look like hinges and swivels. Making the shoulder panels look like either iron or maybe even leather or lead. What would be the difference of those three? And how would you make that read in clay? This exact same process has happened throughout history. Here's some ancient Egyptian sculptures in various stages of development with the tools that they used as well. They started with the big, major forms first, capturing the general flow and pose. Then they took those major forms and they refined them even further. They got the middle-sized anatomy and designs. Well, here's a plane that looks like it could be for a face with a headdress and a beard. And we've got some arms starting to take shape here. And then after this is in place, you work another degree of tightness after that. Small forms. Well, on the face now we have eyes, nose, ears, and such. Again, start with major forms first. It won't look anything like the finished product. It'll be basic shapes. For example, triangles for the legs, cylinders for the arms, a sphere for the head, and kind of a rectangular slab for the body. Build up and refine metal designs. Okay, so now we have a torso, we've got limbs with hands, and this face actually has quite a bit of detail attached already, but we don't know if it's skin or fur or what. And then over here on the edge, we have accessories that are added. We've got actual fur textures put into it, more detail given to the hands and the gloves, and props and products put on with boots. Think practically when you sculpt. What can you do to make it easier on you? It would be very difficult to sculpt from the hat all the way to the toes. Rather, just get a base body, sculpt the hat and the bow separately, attach it all at the very end. So let's break down those three in detail. If you've taken my drawing classes, you already know how to do this, and those skills will translate directly into sculpting. If we were to sculpt this bunny rabbit, by understanding the major and minor forms that compose its structure, that would translate directly into sculpting you would basically use, as a beginner, these nine shapes. You would get nine different pieces of clay in the general shape, put them together, and then mold them to begin looking like the rabbit. There are many different ways to do this, but this is the way I'd advise you as the beginner to do so if you've never sculpted before. You need to know how clay works. So these are the three S's, slip, score, and smooth. Anytime you join two pieces of clay together, they're going to fall apart, especially when the clay dries out. You first need to get what's called slip. Slip is liquid clay, basically mud. It's used to bond clay together like glue. So there will be a reservoir of slip that you can use. Scoring is when you take a stabby bit or something that's pokey like a toothpick and you create little hatch marks on all of the pieces that will be joined together. So you would create little scores, that would be grooves or gashes in maybe some of these elements, apply some slip to it using, you know, like a popsicle stick or your finger, and then mash them together and they'll stick. Smoothing is when you blend those bits together. You can use a tool or your finger, but I recommend using a tool dipped in water, and then start to smooth the seams together. At the end, after you've attached it, it should appear seamless. And here we have the beginning of a rhinoceros that is in its big major forms. Let's go on to the second stage, middle-sized forms. These will use actual techniques to do it. I call this building up or layering. So the leap from 
this down here in the lower corner to this resembling a rhinoceros, that's a pretty big leap. Here's what you generally do at that stage. You focus on middle-sized forms. That means adding mass and volume to this thing. Here, we have just a couple of cylinders, all right? Here, we have a belly, hips, pelvis, chin, jaw, ears, a lot of things that are different than cylinders. You grab little pieces of clay and you create what's called a coil. A coil is a small cylinder of clay, or you can use a tiny little slab. And if we were to take this rhinoceros and make his belly bulge out, you would grab a piece of clay, stretch it over that area, and smooth it out until it's seamless. Ta-da! Now you've got the belly. You do this for facial features as well. Here's an example of sculpting the mouth. You would make a coil for the top lip, a coil for the bottom lip, and even get some different coils for the different muscles and the chin and such, and then using your tool, smooth it. And it's almost like icing to a degree, especially if the clay is still moist. Just mold and sculpt the shapes till they flow into each other and it becomes smooth. Again, this is not a finished sculpt. This is just the middle stage. We're only two thirds of the way there. There's no detail. When detailing, in general, you do what we just did by layering only on a smaller scale. Let's take a look at this sculpture of a horse's leg in process. Right up here we have defined muscle groups. This artist knew about the anatomy of the horse and really wanted it to be pretty realistic. This is how they got to that point. They have the big legs sculpted and then by making a coil that is about the size of that muscle, they then applied it and then smoothed it out. So this is what it would look like on your piece as you're taking this nubby looking cylinder of a limb and making it look more like the real limb of an animal. You do the exact same thing on a smaller scale. Here are some screenshots from a video demonstrating how an artist sculpts an eagle head. It's not enough just to have an eagle-like head. This artist is going for an eagle head. Those are two different things. So we notice that, hey, he needs a little bit more bulk up on the forehead. Well, with a teeny tiny little coil, he applies that mass and then smooths it into the form, bulking up the shape of the forehead. And you can use a wide variety of tools to achieve this, even your fingers. Now we're starting to get into detailing. When detailing, know that you're using your tools for pretty much all of it. The use of the fingers really goes out the window. You use water and your tools to do a variety of different things. So when detailing, know that this generally takes the longest out of the entire sculpt. About 80% of your sculpt is pretty much done at this point, just like the eagle, but there are no feathers, there's no definition in the beak. All that 20% is gonna take the rest of the time. So it requires patience on your part. Be patient. Also, use your tools most of all. Maintain a steady moisture level. If your clay dries out, bye-bye detailing ability. There are two major ways for beginners that I teach for detailing. The first is adding, and the second is removing. An additive method, a subtractive method. Both of these are called relief. Relief is when, when there's a texture across the surface. So if this is, say, steel or iron, this artist used a brush to create that kind of fibrous steel texture. And here, with scaling, the artist is taking his tool and using a subtractive method, carving out notches. Details are three-dimensional. They are not little lines or drawings in the piece. What you're doing is you're either taking away mass or adding mass. Removing is when you use different tools as well to take clay apart. So you see this artist on his jar wants to have plant life coming out the side of it. Well, do you notice how he trimmed and cut away the negative space that was in here? And you can see it right down here where it's marked up. You remove large chunks and with little scrapers, big ones first and moving on to littler ones, you can trim the little extra bits that are hanging off and even make it smooth. Remember to use water. Here is an example of an artist adding feathers to a sculpture. He didn't cut away, he added clumps that he kind of pinched off on the top and attached to it. Now after having done that, you would get a scoring tool and then start to carve and 
carve grooves and create these edges and fine little fibers that resemble feathers, one at a time. Let's take a look at hair. Again, it works on a big, middle to little scale. Big meaning he plots down the overall mass of the hair, and even within that mass, you've got individual tresses of hair, clumps and clusters of hair, right? And then middle, maybe he, this artist would use a pokey kind of a knife and then start to give even more definition to each one of those clumps of hair and then get progressively smaller with smaller tools to create multiple fibers within each clump. The same applies for pretty much any type of texture. Let's look at this curly hair, all right? Look on the back of the skull. We've got a mass that's going to be the hair. Then we have large tools that create these divots and grooves and then progressively smaller and smaller tools doing the exact same thing like this right here, like these steel brushes, to the point where you've got clumps and teeny little pockets. So whether you're taking away, like in this area, or adding, like in this area, in general, you want to strive for good texture and detail in your work, three-dimensionally. So wrapping it up, how do you manage your station when you're sculpting? Well, as a beginner, these are the critical fundamentals that you need to do. Firstly, know that if your clay dries out, there's no going back. So I have spray bottles around. Lightly spritz down your clay very often during class. If your clay starts to get really sticky, maybe give it a couple other spritzes as well. Now, being the nature of clay, it will continue to get more and more firm over time, no matter how often you spray this down. So, so we are working against the clock in that regard. At the very end of class, spritz it down with water and then seal it up in plastic wrap. Make sure it's airtight. Twist that plastic, wrap it and fold it underneath your sculpt so that no air can escape. Again, never let your clay dry out. Even if you miss a class, you need to make plans with somebody else in order to protect your sculpt. If you come back from two or three days absence and your clay has dried out, you're going to have to start over. Clean off all of the tools. Make sure that the tables are squeaky clean. No dust, no mud and ensure that the next students that are coming in are gonna have a clean workspace. Also, any stabby bits, I hang on to those. So make sure you turn those into me. Never let any clay or sediment go down the drain. Always wash your tools and your hands over a bucket instead. That clay is gonna turn into a form of cement once it gets down the pipes and it will destroy the pipes. So be very mindful of this. And then finally, a couple things to remember. When finishing your sculpt, air bubbles, can cause your clay to explode when we fire it. It goes into the kiln, it gets heated up very hot, and if there's any air in there, that air is going to expand and then boom, like a firework, a little bomb going off. Now that could also take out other people's sculptures. So here are a couple of things to do to prevent. Using one of my big stabby bits, it's almost like a needle, penetrate your sculpt with a ventilation hole. That means if you could go through the eye, you could go through the nostril or the underside of the foot so that there's some sort of a hollow area that allows any air to escape when the clay is being fired. Also photograph your work before it gets put up for firing. That way if it blows up or gets blown up by someone else's work, we'll have the documentation I'll be able to grade your work. I hope you found this helpful students. This is just an introduction to how clay works and how to work it. And if you've got questions in class, come see me and I look forward to seeing you. Take care.